Hello. Don't worry, <laughs> they will join us and they will be playing quite a lot. But I thought, since I'm going to speak for a while and go to the piano, I'd give them a little rest before they get going. Then it's going to be unbearable, You're just constant playing. Okay. I know they, you look like a lineup for a baseball team. Like this. <laughs> you know, in this lecture on Elgar and his quint piano quintet, it occurred to me, to, I have to say something about the fact that Elgar himself had a brief stint as a lecturer. And that's not true of many of the composers that I talk about with you here. Certainly not Schumann. Um, but it was last week, in case you're wondering why I mentioned Schumann. Elgar's lectures were very unsuccessful. And I don't want to get into it too much, but uh, I'm going to first quote from a brief account of his most important lecture, which is worth discussing a little bit. It was called The Future of English Music, because you probably know that England suffered a lot after Purcell. They didn't really have a famous composer for a long time, except Handel, who was German. Um, and they were always beating themselves up about it. And when Elgar finally got an appointment to speak in this lecture series, he really went to town about how bad English music was. So this is the first account that uh, was written about that lecture. With its high-sounding enunciation of incomprehensible theories, it was one of the most embarrassing failures to which it has ever been my misfortune to listen. The opening was greeted with the respectful attention which Edward's eminence deserved. But as the evening wore on and point after point missed its mark, feet were shuffled, a crossfire of coughs set in, and one gradually realized that the day was a hopeless loss. <laughs> However, Elgar's wife in her diary writes this of the same lecture. E spoke splendidly at Birmingham and looked very nice in gown and hood, had a great reception. <laughs> you can't really tell from, you know, primary sources can be very confusing. <laughs> Elgar himself, when he got off the platform, said to someone who wrote it down right after the lecture, I must go and get some strychnine. This is the end for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are, it made me feel really good about some of my lectures, actually. So, <clears throat> one of the, uh, what are the, some of the things that he said? Uh, here is a, a, I'm going to quote just a few things, because it's important to understand that he came into a situation, uh, an English, the English musical situation, that was not an easy place to, to inhabit. Here's a quote. I should like especially to look back for one moment and see where our English composers have been, the relation they bore to the great composers of their day. Dr. Richard Strauss, Richard Strauss, in a vivid speech made at Dusseldorf three or four years back, threw a brilliant illumination on this somewhat darkened picture. We all knew, although we dared not say so in many words, what he then told us, that Arne was somewhat less than Handel, that Sterndale Bennett was somewhat less than Mendelssohn, and that some Englishmen of later day were not quite so great as Brahms. <laughs> People have been good enough to write to me, this is still Elgar speaking, at the moment. They evidently expect some form of teaching here at Birmingham, which would more nearly meet their own cause and transform persons of very ordinary intellect into composers of genius. That scarcely is in within the, the powers even of the University of Birmingham and standing on Warwickshire land, and with a delicate reference to the brumblings of those people who do not succeed through, I fear, their own fault, I would venture to remind them of the old pastoral proverb, sick sheep make a sorry shepherd. <laughs> a little more from the same lecture. I just love this lecture for all the wrong reasons. 20, 25 years ago, some of the rhapsodies of Liszt became very popular. I think every Englishman since has called some work a rhapsody. Could anything be more inconceivably inept? To rhapsodize is one thing Englishmen cannot do. <laughs> and then he says one nice thing about Sir Hubert Parry, who says he is the head of our art in this country. Hubert Parry, with whom no cloud of formality can dim the healthy sympathy and broad influence he exerts, and we may hope long to continue this, how he exerts this upon us. Who was um, Hubert Parry? Does anyone know any of his music? 
Ah, three people. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm going to play a brief passage by Hubert Parry just so that you have a context. Actually, before I do that, though, how about Sterndale Bennett? William Sterndale Bennett? No one? I can understand that, actually. Um, first, here's a little tiny bit of music by William Sterndale Bennett, who was a close friend of Mendelssohn's. And uh, this goes way before Elgar, but it's the problem that he was dealing with, and uh, it does affect the whole language of that time. Here's a phrase from a piano piece by Bennett. lovely, four-square, proper, dignified, formal, boring. But lovely. Um, Arthur Sullivan, I didn't mean to tell you everything I thought about that phrase, but anyway, Arthur Sullivan was also uh, <coughs> around and composing when Elgar was a young man. I shouldn't say also because he wasn't. And as a young man, Elgar got promised to have a reading of his orchestral music at a rehearsal, and he was very excited by this showed up, the orchestra was ready to read his music for him, and in walked Arthur Sullivan with a new opera and said that this had to be read right now. So they did, and they never read the work of poor El Elgar. Um, Elgar was not like uh, what you might expect if you think of him as the great, famous British composer, because he grew up kind of an outsider. His family didn't have money. Uh, he was brought up Catholic in a Protestant country. Um, he was self-taught. He taught himself to play the violin, something that if you know anything about the violin, can you imagine <laughs> teaching yourself to play the violin? Um, but his father was an organist at a Catholic church and a piano tuner and owned a shop. And then when he married, who would soon become uh, Elgar's mother, she converted to Catholicism because of the church job that he had. And he told her, don't do that. That's an exact quote. And, um, but she did it anyway, and they brought him up uh, and his sister as Catholics, and he wrote a lot of very important Catholic music. In fact, there's even something in the quintet that relates to that. But Elgar really needed to find a job when he was a young man. And I'll get to Hubert Parry in a second. And the job that he got is one of the most unusual jobs for any composer in the history of music. He was the band director for the Worcester City and County Pauper Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> That's the name of it. What did he do? He did not write orchestral music for lunatics, but he wrote, not a phrase we use anymore, I understand that, but a, he wrote for the staff orchestra that performed for the inmates. And some of the music that he wrote, you know, he got a, it was great. It's like working for a, a documentary film company. You write lots of music, you learn your trade, you have to turn out something every week. Every time he wrote a little polka or waltz, he got paid five shillings. And with those five shillings, he could stay in a hotel for one night in London because that's all it cost. Um, in fact, just so you know, when, it, when Elgar was a young man, England was incredibly cheap. You could go to theater, everything. London, I mean, very, very inexpensively. And even in 1934, when he died, Here's a little real estate information for you. I looked this up, I just think it's amazing. You could buy, in 1934, outside of London, a 10-bedroom house with nine antechambers and a huge kitchen, acres and acres of land, and a tennis court for 1,600 pounds. Interesting. So Elgar and his wife never had that much money, but they lived with valets and two maids and a butler and a cook. So they had a, quite an extraordinary life. Now back to Parry. Oh, by the way, don't you think there's a good connection there between Schumann, who ended his life in an insane asylum, and Elgar, who started his life, his professional career, working in an insane asylum? That's about it, you know. But it isn't about it, because actually Hubert Parry wrote a lot about uh, Schumann in the Grove, the first Grove Dictionary of Music. It was a new dictionary at the time. And Elgar, who was really self-taught, would read the Grove Dictionary, and in it, 
learn technique, learn opinions, get excited and stimulated by what people wrote, and he considered Hubert Parry his teacher. And Hubert Parry's articles on Schumann really got him excited. So for example, uh, here is a comment about Schumann from the original Grove Dictionary by Hubert Parry. Schumann seemed to have developed his technique by the force of his feelings and was always more dependent upon them in the making of his works than upon general principles and external stock rules. Now that is what you want to hear if you're self-taught. And it's also true that even if you learn stock rules and the techniques of a trade and you know how to write a fugue and you understand what a sonata is and you learn your harmony, you are not a composer unless you are writing from your actual feelings and thoughts. So when he says that Schumann, to quote it again, was always more dependent on the force of his feelings than technique. We know that's true. It describes him very well. That also describes what made it possible for Elgar, as a self-taught composer, to move out of that problem of the, of the formal and the restrictive because he really worked from his own emotions. And his own emotions were very stormy. He was often depressed. He was often... I, I don't want to say he was manic depressive like I did about Schumann last week, but believe it or not, he is listed in that book again as a possibility. So we don't really know. But he was often depressed for reasons that nobody has been able to identify in terms of correlation with his actual life. So here's a little bit of music by Hubert Parry, who in a way, through the Grove Dictionary, was a teacher of Elgar. A, a little bit of piano music. on like that. It's kind of interesting stuff. It's a lot more interesting than the Sterndale Bennett, and later, and very romantic. Okay, now, to get to the quintet, before I ask you to come, and will in just a moment, a brief introduction. This is a late work, and there's not a lot of chamber music by Elgar, but in this case, he and his wife had retired to, well, not really retired, but they thought that he was retiring, and he didn't retire to a beautiful house, one of the many homes that they were able to buy or rent because everything was so inexpensive, lots of land. It was called Brinkwells. And Elgar became interested in a legend about the land and the trees outside his house. This used to be thought to be true, but now we know that it's true. And the trees were very gnarly and strange and mysterious, especially at night or with the moonlight coming through them. And the legend was that some Spanish monks had performed impious rites outside in that area and were turned forever into trees for their evil. It appeals to his Catholicism, uh, especially the Spanish, you know. But also he liked to write Spanish-flavored music when he was young. And so that was a perfect thing. But not only that, more importantly, he was reading a novel that was about witchcraft in that area of England and about evil and uh, magic spells right around where he was living. So it was even better. He was, we know he was reading it right at that time. The novel was by Bulwer Lytton. Some of you know who that is, I see. <laughs> Bulwer Lytton. Let this not say anything about uh, Elgar's taste in literature. He, he, he read everything, apparently. If you're not sure who Bulwer Lytton is, there is to this day in England, a contest to see if you can write an opening paragraph for a novel that is as terrible <laughs> as one by Bulwer-Lytton. <laughs> the one by Bulwer-Lytton is quite famous. It starts like this, or this is it. It was a dark and stormy night. 
The, tra the rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets, for it is in London that our scene lies rattling along the house steps, that's the rain, and fiercely agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. Do you want to hear the winner, recent winner of the... Uh, <laughs> this, I think, is much funnier. This is incredible. Cheryl's mind turned like the veins of a wind-powered turbine, chopping her sparrow-like thoughts into bloody pieces that fell onto the growing pile of forgotten memories. <laughs> okay, we can start now. <laughs> okay, now we're going to hear the opening of the quintet, which is not at all like the opening of a Burwell Lytton novel. In no way. Yes, we're delighted to have, <coughs> once again, the Amphion Quartet and Gil Kalish. Thank you both, all, for here. <laughs> so maybe we should, let's hear from the opening up until number two. <laughs> Isn't that great to stop on what chord do you think that was, that scary chord? <laughs> yes, a diminished seventh chord. They know a lot here. Um, Gil, I'm, is it possible for me to go to the keyboard for a bit? Thank you. I, I, sorry to... Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You sit there, you sit there, and then you sit over here. Okay. Um, I, the opening, you, you heard how mysterious and strange it is. It's actually very unusual for Elgar. There's practically nothing else. I don't really even, I can't think of anything else, that has so many silences, little dissonances, strange creeping chromaticisms, inspired, like Schumann, by the force of his feelings rather than by some kind of technical idea. But you can't write just by the force of feelings. You have to also have a technique that embodies those ideas. So let's take a look at this opening for a moment because uh, it, it's a perfect example of Elgar pushing the envelope a little bit. He's not known for being an innovative composer, but he was an original thinker. Pushing the envelope, but the underpinning is very traditional. The first phrase in the piano <laughs> is based, it's a recognizable quote for those like Elgar who grew up in a Catholic church and he replaced his father as the organist and choir director for quite some time, as the opening of Salve Regina, which he didn't have to say and didn't say anywhere. The opening of the Salve Regina is this. And then it starts again. Etc. So this very ghostly thing matters to the story that he's quoting Salve Regina because of the Spanish monks being monks. Maybe they were singing that when this happened. Now, right away, if you're in A minor, which this piece is, to have a G natural makes it clearly modal. Because I if it were really an A minor at that time for simple tonal music, we would have 
Maybe something like, you know. So it's tur it turns out that the G natural modal sound and the, a and the G sharp that's not there yet, but is in the very next phrase. There it is, right? He didn't do this. He didn't keep it modal. It immediately goes into the tonality that we know of the time. This modal, not modal argument is really what the whole first movement and much of the entire piece is about in many ways. It's, and not only that, when this happens, we have, remember in the strings? I'm gonna put together what is the underlying harmony for you by if you take out the little dissonances, if you take out and just play the thirds, this is, this is what's underneath it. the entire opening, everything you just heard. Even this beautiful section here. Sorry. And then. That, that, let me explain where that comes from. The first mutterings in the strings. The three notes are D, whoops. D, D sharp, and E. Now, this is 1918 when he wrote this. That's important to remember. Stravinsky's Rite of Spring had been played. Petrushka had been played. Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra had been played. Um, Debussy was old news, you know. Th there was a lot of very out there music and innovative modern music when he wrote this. So that means, though, for Elgar, if he wants to do something from the force of feeling, something that is more dramatic and creepy than he's used to doing, he could call upon his awareness of these things because he deeply believed that a composer should not be a nationalist. In fact, it's ironic because he's considered the great English composer of that time. But the reason that he succeeded was that he broke out of being just an English composer and he took influence from German composers, especially uh, Mahler, and he took, um, and also uh, Russian composers like Tchaikovsky and, um, well, also Brahms, back to Germany, Schumann, back to Germany, and even César Franck in France. All of these composers influenced him profoundly, even Richard Strauss, who was his contemporary and lived much longer. Um, he was influenced by Strauss, and Strauss thought that he was a fabulous, I mean, he thought he himself was fabulous too, but he thought that Elgar was a fabulous composer, which is saying something for Strauss to say that. So, getting back to the point here is that he takes these, this tonal idea and divides up with chromaticism, with little dissonant pitches and silences He, he divides something up and he starts to use it not like Schoenberg, but in his mind, it is like Schoenberg. Because he takes D, D sharp, and E, and he brings it back here in the opposite direction as part of the theme. And then this motif, which comes later, is the same upside down exact pitches. All, and then here again, when it repeats, all throughout this piece, you have these half steps falling, and I'll point out some of them in threes, like that, or rising. And then again, the, to amplify that, the rising motifs and the falling motifs get bigger and bigger and bigger, and that becomes the sense of what the piece is about. The dissonances of chromaticism, the spirituality, let's say, of the Gregorian sound, of the modalism, and the playing field of tonal harmony, which is where they meet. You could almost say that the ghosts 
in the piece are either gnarly chromatic ghosts or Salve Regina modal ghosts, and the reality of the place that they haunt and Brinkwell's where he and his wife Alice lived is A minor, a normal key, but it's infested and haunted by all of these things. <clears throat> um, okay, let's move on a little bit. Sorry, Gil, thank you. Uh, then the Regina sound of A to G starts off in the piano again, but it gives us a whole new thing that sounds almost exactly like Brahms. Why don't we hear uh, from number two? say up through number four. How's that? Now, that establishes almost this, like, I don't believe in ghosts, I believe in Brahms. You know, <laughs> the, the haunted chromatic strangeness of the opening, which almost sounds like a different composer, to be frank, or frank. <laughs> uh, almost sounds like a different composer, then goes back to Brahms. But there's a connection, which is you've been hearing, you know, <laughs> if you take away that G sharp, that's exactly what this is about. It begins with the modal, and then this section also begins with that, but the tune insists and ends that we do have our sharp leading tone and we do have our tonic and we are in A minor. Right after that though, the ghosts come back with no transition. It just stops, there's silence, and the ghosts are back. Now, it's great that there's no transition because it sounds here, as I said, like Elgar has won. I don't believe in ghosts, I'm an Englishman, which doesn't actually work to say that. But anyway, they <laughs> love ghosts in England. But, and I don't believe that the place is haunted. I'm done, A minor, G sharp, it's all fine. Silence, and then the ghosts come back. They're the exact same ghosts, but then he takes the opportunity of moving ghostly-wise into the Spanish, uh, first of m several Spanish dances. Now, from the point of view of being inspired by the legend, it's good that they're Spanish. From the point of view of being a composer, it's great for him, because he loved Spanish-flavored music. Now, it's important to remember that one of the problems with the nationalism and the defining of what a composer's role is in society, especially in the 19th into the 20th century, but mostly the 19th century, and he was born in the middle of the 19th century, um, is the kind of fake exoticism, uh, the lure of other countries as exotic so we can get the flavor, like Carmen. is a wonderful opera, but it's not really French. I mean, it's not, it's French is what I meant to say. It's not really Spanish. You know, it, it takes place in Spain, but it's French music. Um, and, you know, Rimsky-Korsakov's visiting all these Asian or oriental lands to write music. Th there was this, this sense of exoticism which allowed composers to color their music with the flavors of other scales and other modes and use um, tunes from different countries. But it also was a, a source of, uh, problematic arguing among the composers, especially in England, who felt they didn't have their own language. And Elgar didn't worry about that. See, th it was actually a split. Hubert Parry was on the other side, and uh, eventually Vaughan Williams was on the other side. The other side is, let's use English folk music and be English, and everything should be English, and let's not be influenced by these other countries because that will drag us down and we're just not as good when we try to compete on German tunes or French harmonies or things like that, or German architecture and French, uh, the luxurious French chords, you know, this sort of thing. So instead, you have Hubert Parry, Vaughan Williams, and quite a few other composers, and then you have Elgar who felt, I need to write my Spanish dance, and I want to write a march or something that 
reminds you of German music. All these things are important. And it, he was proud to be influenced by Mahler and Tchaikovsky and et cetera, because he felt that if it's going to be truly international music, which he was the first composer, according to at least to many people uh, in, in England, the first English composer to really be universal and have a universal language, it probably was because he did accept all that. So in this Spanish dance, um, there's a kind of hidden agenda too which is, y you can stay there, but actually, would you play that? Yeah, thank you. Well, let's play a little bit of this with everybody, and you'll hear the Spanish dance, but what you're already hearing in the left hand, uh, somebody, you heard that already? Okay, good. <laughs> that the A and the G of this harmony is the modal AG. <coughs> So the bass line and the harmonies are derived from the opening Salve Regina, its modalism of the AG natural, but the harmonies now have been, they're richer, they're romantic, and they're somewhat Spanish. Let's hear some of that. Okay, great, great. So not only, you see, even though this sounds episodic, which according to some people is a criticism, but you know, it's episodic and it's suddenly Spanish dancing, it actually relates two ways to the opening that are very rigorous intellectually. One I already said, which is that the bass line <laughs> comes out of that. But the other thing is that the tune and is the half step of the opening, right? It's the ghosts. It's the same three half steps. It's really two half steps, three notes. Because I, I always do this, if you've got three notes, you've got two intervals. <laughs> but they're all half steps. So he's taken the ghosts and normalized them into a Spanish dance. If, in other words, the ghosts, they might have been, maybe the ghosts were actually nice, I don't know. Maybe they didn't deserve to be turned into trees. But there are these chromatic ghosts filled with silences, moving in half steps, which now are dancing, and the, the harmony underneath them comes from Salve Regina. Okay, let's move on a little bit, because you'll get to hear all of this again in a moment. That goes on for a very long time. It's actually surprising that Elgar, with his kind of rigorous way of, of writing and formal structure, allows that, that chord progression to go on for really two pages, uh, which is a lot. Many, many measures of back and forth. It's kind of like a guitar to hear, you know. Um, only guitars don't play that high, but you know what I mean, it's down there. But it's very much like a guitar where you play a chord and you just slide down and you slide up and you slide down, you know? And that's basically, and it's very, very Spanish for that reason. Then that becomes, opens up into a more romantic version of the same thing. Maybe we should hear some of that at six. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. I let that go on for a little while because uh, after the Spanish dance is, uh, is contained, it obviously opens up and becomes a huge romantic 
uh, very dramatic thing that you just heard. But then we have, oh, now here I'm just going to, if I can ask you to get up just for a second, sorry. Then we have this passage, which we just heard, where the chords are these. Over and over and over and it's the same two chords. Which are a version of what we just heard. That's in, first it was A major. Remember, you don't need to know the details, but the idea is coming. A, a major and G minor 7, that's the Spanish thing. And then it becomes a minor, it becomes the exact argument that I was talking about between, thank you, Phil, the exact argument between the A, G versus A, G sharp, between normal tonality, Germanic, Brahmsian tonality, and the force of feelings inspired Spanish modal derived tonality. That's a split. There are two things going on. And ironically, it's almost like the split in the, in the history of English music up to that point, that you've got the folks music, the folk music inspired composers and those who are not interested in folk music. Elgar said over and over he was not interested in folk music, but he, and he never used it. But here, he's dividing the world into a kind of a Spanish folk music and something that is against that, which feels more like him, like his, himself more real, which is the A minor tonality and the haunting Spanish folk music. So he actually, the dialectic that was at the core of the argument in England at the time becomes this piece. And it becomes this piece because of a story by Burwell Lytton. Oh well, <laughs> maybe not. So that moves on. Um, and then we get, ah, I should say something else, but you can stay there. <laughs> um, we hear this a lot. And then eventually it becomes, you'll hear this, and thi it's the same thing as the argument between the half step and the, the modal. It becomes again, the tune returns, the Salve Regina comes back. The, the opening returns, and we have been through so much that when this opening returns, we understand it differently. And this is a very normal part of music, but it's not a simple formal thing. It's really important to understand that the return of any idea in a well-written piece should seem different. It's not just the repeat. In fact, there is no repeat. You don't go back to the opening, which is something that bothered Beethoven, the formality of always going back to the opening. He started to do less and less of that, then he started to write first and second endings of the opening, and then he got rid of it completely because he started to feel that the narrative would be destroyed by repetitions instead of moving forward. And so uh, in Elgar's time, you're not going to find repetitions casually thrown in. So when this comes back, it is not in the same key, and it has been completely transformed by what has come before it, which is what memory in music is about. The only thing that musical form can do is give you some sort of narrative which can inform your memory of the things you've heard already. So you're hearing something you've heard, but it's transformed. And if you have trouble, I think that's, you know, I, I think I've said this before, but one of the reasons that listening to classical music is a challenge for many people, especially in our society now, is that if you don't have words, you have to engage your memory over a longer period of time. And when things come back, it's only meaningful and feels interesting and engaging if you hear the difference, if you hear the transformation. It used to be that audiences knew when the key changed because everybody understood that sort of thing. I'm not sure that's true anymore, <coughs> that key changes cause uh, you know, excitement or wandering away from the key causes tension. It does, but the level at which it does is complicated, especially when we've had so much chromatic music where keys have disappeared. So here it comes back and it's quite different because of what's happened. And then we go into a, sal oh, a Salve Regina in which Brahms meets the monks. <laughs> you know where that is? <laughs> that's, that's at uh, measure number, uh, rehearsal nine. Here's the tune, the Salve Regina tune compressed a little bit in the uh, strings, especially in the first violin. 
And it's also in the piano in the top voice. And four against three, Brahms' favorite thing. Two against three, four against three, the pattern, you know, of bump, 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 beam, bump. You know, this, the pattern of uh, polyrhythmic rocking. It happens with a Brahmsian texture, Brahmian, Brahmsian rhythms, Brahmsian harmonies, but the monks are there. Let's hear some of that at bar nine. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Now, you know what's interesting? That four against three rhythm <coughs> came up in the Schumann last week. And in the Schumann, the slow movement, the funeral movements, I know a lot of you were here, and just pretend you were if you weren't. The Schumann had the fours against the threes in a kind of hazy uh, evocation of dreaming and of memory. It was very impressionistic, actually. And the week before, we had the four against three in the Beethoven, Opus 95, in which the four against three was violent and represented a spasm and an attempt <coughs> to break out of a straitjacket. It's amazing what can happen with that. By time Elgar uses four against three, it has been taken by Brahms, who may have gotten it from Schumann after all, taken, it by, taken by Brahms and moved into a realm where it's a normal texture. It's just a beautiful romantic texture. It is beautiful because the four against three is, gives you a constant rocking motion and it gives you a way to hear the harmonies interweaving as the fours and the threes interlock with, with each other. So it's a beautiful texture. In Beethoven, it was unique and strange. In Schumann, it became a kind of poetic vision. And in Brahms, it became his palette. And by Elgar, it is a reference back. I think that's it for four against three. <laughs> um, then, <coughs> there are so many things that happen. We get a kind of fugue, a little bit of a fugue. Uh, it's not, imp is it important to write a fugue? You know, there was a long time when composers felt if they, even Beethoven struggled with this, if you write a fugue, it means something about your learned abilities as a composer. Uh, <coughs> For example, the Grosse Fugue, the great fugue of Beethoven, has written right at the top, you know, um, uh, somewhat learned and somewhat intuitive, that's a translation, somewhat free, somewhat schooled, some, you know, uh <coughs> and the idea was to show that a fugue is something of a learned musician that takes tremendous technique at the same time as he was exploding what a fugue could be with his emotions, the force of feelings that Hubert Parry described in Schumann, I feel like I'm lecturing in a a church in London, if I keep referring to that theme. The force of feelings, <laughs> as described by Parry <laughs> when talking of Schumann, was in fact at work in Beethoven's Grosse Fugue. Do you like that kind of lecture? <laughs> no, no, right. That's what it started to sound like to me. But it's true, actually. That's the kind of, I, I think that must have been the tone of voice used by Elgar, right? When they, it doesn't even matter what you say when you speak like an Englishman like that. I've said it all from there. And his neck talks out and he goes to shout. That sort of thing. <clears throat> I actually knew a, a great English composer, Nicholas Moore, wonderful composer, who talked like this in real life. You know, this is the way he talked. When he gave lectures, though, he talked like that. And I, I asked him why he was that. He goes, oh, a lecture's a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so we have a little bit of a fugue, but I don't think Elgar is doing it to prove anything. He's way past that. And there is this kind of, um, let's hear some of it. It's not a strict fugue in any way either, but it, it does, it conjures up the fugue. And I think it, it remember a fugue also is, um, it was once defined by someone who didn't like fugues as a voice running away with the, all the other voices chasing it and let's hope they never come back, something like that. <laughs> because fugue, you know, also, it, it, it does mean chase, basically, to, to flee as in fugitive. So 
it does have a fugitive quality, and there is a, a mental condition called the fugue in which you're supposedly outside of yourself in some way that I'm not even going to begin to discuss. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, let's hear um, some of that contrapuntal music starting at 10. Thank you. Perfect. I'm glad I didn't have to stop you. <laughs> Thank you for stopping yourself. Okay, uh, I need to be at the piano for a moment. Now, that, that's a pretty powerful fugal section, which then opens up into another uh, brilliant section. But what is it based on? Well, you probably recognize this. Sorry. From the beginning, you didn't recognize that, but here it is again. That's right at the beginning of the piece, right after the ghosts. You might have forgotten it. That was the Brahms enters. Okay, but those eight chords, those eight pulses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That does come from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that's where it comes from. In this phrase again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in other words, there are these two big arcs of eight pulses in the Salve Regina theme, and then the chord progression of the Brahms is the same pulses, the fugue is the same pulses. So everything is intertwined. And then you get, where Gil just stopped, this fantastic, um, and, and that's, we're gonna hear this in a moment, but what happens is that progression of eight chords, which does change a little bit, it happens three times. The first time it's here, starting here. The next one is here. And the next one is here. They're going down like this. Sorry. Ah, some of you got it, yes. Right, remember, that? It's, it, it's everything. It, those descending, it's this. It's that which comes from the opening, right? So the very first, which becomes, also becomes, becoming, becoming. So everything he's doing relates in a Beethoven-esque manner, in other words, with complete uh, integrity of every detail, with every small thing becoming a big thing. With every, as Tovey, who was a musicologist, who wrote awful music but great articles, um, once said that if in, in a piece of music, if you see a dot in the sky, you want to know whether or not it's an airplane later. That's not that good, but he said that. Um, Chekhov said to playwrights, if there's a gun on the mantelpiece, it should go off before the end of act one. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> but it's the same idea. You know, if you're going to set these things up, you should follow them through, you know? I'm sorry if that's gone too far, but okay, right. <laughs> Let me say it again. If there's a gun on the mantelpiece, <laughs> it should go off by the end of act one. Okay, so basically he sets up several things and all of them, all of them are completely followed through in every detail. One is the modal Salve Regina with the whole step beginning. Then there's the A minor quality with the half steps, but those half steps are also in the ghost, da, ba, 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 and those half steps become a new theme, and then they become another theme in the Spanish music, and then the whole steps in the in Salve Regina are in the harmony accompanying the half steps of the Spanish tune, and et cetera, et cetera. Then those big chords, which are based on the opening number of beats in all the tunes, 
are spaced in half steps. I'm so glad that composers are good when I'm looking at this because otherwise I have nothing to talk about. <laughs> um, let's see. Music does come back. Uh, eventually, there's a kind of recapitulation, but it does have, uh, and this is something he got from Brahms, there's a reversal of the order of some of the things. So if we go to bar uh, 24, for example, I mean, yeah, rehearsal number 24. First of all, the strings are playing what they played before, but the piano is tremoloing like basses and cellos in an orchestra. Thank you, Gil. There they are. So let's, let's do that section right there, and you can hear the strings are repeating what they played before, but the piano is involved now. Very good, thank you. Now that's the second part. Remember, that, that comes after the Salve Regina, but in the return, it's reversed. So you hear this first, then the Salve Regina opening. It's not that amazing to do that, but it's very effective and beautiful here. In other words, it's not the strangest thing to reverse the order, but it's worth mentioning because it's a technique. Uh, it's palindromic a little bit, you know, and uh, you would think that's a normal thing to do, but uh, it wasn't for a very long time. The structures, um, you ha you, after the exposition and development, you would have a recapitulation and things would stay in the order that they originally were. That started to change. I mean, Beethoven experimented with all sorts of orderings of things, only in the late works, but mostly the late quartets, and of bringing things back from earlier movements. Uh, and then in the Romantic period, this became more common. Schubert did a little bit, Brahms a lot, and Schumann, uh, obviously was a very important part of this. So this idea though, probably for Elgar, is indebted to Schumann, who was in many ways his uh, great inspiration from his youth. Yes, he was inspired harmonically by Tchaikovsky, as I said, and Frank and Mahler and all these people, but Schumann remained for him probably the greatest influence because of what Parry had said. And I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say it again like that, but but this idea that the form should follow your imagination rather than your imagination trying to pour things into a form. Now, no great composer, no great composer ever thought of form as, as a straitjacket or as a, a vehicle or a vessel. It, it, form evolves out of ideas. On the other hand, sometimes the forms became uh, a bit commonplace. I like to compare musical form to courtroom procedure. Just for, I've, you may have heard me do this before, but it's really valid because courtroom procedure has rules, but the rules are there for clarity so you can follow the argument and make a decision. And those rules have to do with presenting ideas in a certain order and then allowing for a different view of those ideas, having those things discussed and then sorted out. That's pretty much sonata form. In fact, the structure of music is better thought of as a procedure like courtroom than some kind of form that's stuck, like, you know, that you put things into. It's not a dollhouse. It's a procedure. And just like no two court trials are the same, really, because there are different people, there are different people involved in the case, there are different people trying the case, and the story is different, that's true of music that the form is not a form, it's a procedure that allows for an infinite variety of scenarios, and that's basically what happens. So Elgar's scenarios are alive and happening because he is attached to that idea and he's engaged with the idea that his imagination, which here is inspired by ghosts and mystery and the story um, and probably some terrible sentences, which uh, luckily are not here, uh, that that inspires how the form unfolds. And it makes sense then to go backwards towards that beautiful Salve, Salve Regina and then the whispering ghosts and have that die away. That's better than doing it in the order it came in because the order it came in was moving deeper into something. So he has to come out of the woods the way he came, right? It would be very strange to tell a story about going into the woods and then go back to the house and then back into part of the woods but that's what a certain sonata structures would be like if you followed them. So basically it's going in to see the ghosts and back to his house and closing the door with 5-1.
Sometimes I wish he hadn't closed the door on this, but... Okay. Uh, there's also a beautiful moment right before the end where this motif is played this way and it's harmonized. Can we just hear right the strings right at 26 for three bars? Yeah. Now, did you hear the, vi the violin goes, this is, and that's also, and so he saves it and saves it, and finally, only once, right before the end, it's harmonized almost like Wagner. If it makes you think of Wagner, that's fine. It's not the same harmony that, you know, you're probably thinking also of, you know, uh, you know Wagner. But it's so close. It's very close to that world. <clears throat> you know, Wagner was composing when Elgar was little. I mean, there's a lot of overlap. Freud, Elgar, all these people whose lives went from um, the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. It's an amazing things that they've seen change in the arts, you know, and in everything, but in the arts too. Uh, unlike Strauss, Elgar only lived through one world war. Strauss lived through two and became embroiled in, you know, it's an incredible thing to think about, that sort of a, in his prime for both of them in many ways. Okay, now, I think I've basically covered what we need to hear in order to hear this movement, and we have about the, the right amount of time to hear it. So we will do that, and <clears throat> before we do, I just two little quotes, because after the music, I don't think I'm going to say any more. This is a quote of Benjamin Britten talking about the problem of the folk music versus the, uh, the professional composer music, and the, the idea, should you be influenced by foreign kinds of music? Britten says, for two centuries, English music has been second rate with no more than local importance. The composers have been too ready to simply imitate European, especially Viennese and Italian colleagues. The fault lay not in the influences, but in the lack of talent and inability to assimilate them. Perhaps, this is brilliant, by the way, the next sentence. Perhaps the piece of music that brings tears most easily to the eyes of an expatriate Englishman is Delius's On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring which is founded on a Norwegian tune written by a man who spent most of his life out of England, who responded most to the influences of Grieg and Liszt and whose publishers were Viennese. <laughs> so, the last comment, I'm gonna give it to Benjamin Britten because I, I, you can't say this better. It is only those who accept their loneliness and refuse all refuge, whether of tribal nationalism or airtight intellectual systems who will carry on human heritage.
Thank you. Thank you. As you leave, consider yourself graduated <laughs> and take next season's brochure as your diploma. Good night. <laughs>